Výborně, tak teda ještě jednou dobré odpoledne všem. Vítám vás na čtvrté přednášce tohoto semestru a abych to už teda déle zdržovala, tak jenom řeknu, že naším dnešním hostem je paní doktorka Simge Ozdal Oktaj z Monsterské univerzity. A tímto ji tedy vítám. Simge, welcome into our lecture and the floor is all yours, so go ahead. Uh, we cannot hear you. Your mic is off. Yes, I'm always doing it. Sorry. <laughs> you are not <laughs> uh, Thank you very much. So um, let me share my screen and start my talk. Now, can you see the presentation? Yes. OK, great then. Uh, so thank you very much for the brief introduction and uh, I am Simge Oktay. Um, I'm a postdoc at uh, University of Münster and I am very happy to take part in this uh, lecture series with you today. And um, the today's topic is data-driven methods and immersive environments for citizen-based urban design. Um, so before starting to the um, presentation, I would like to give you a general outlook. I will talk about um, a bit about my background <laughs> um, at first because it is uh, also the backbone uh, of the today's topic and also very related with the examples uh, that I'm going to present. And then uh, I will talk about the motivation, current state of the topic and the problems that we um, would like to emphasize and how we use data-driven approaches in immersive environments uh, to solve those problems is the next um, that I'm going to present. And I will give you a short definitions and I will give some examples um, that we are working at IFKI right now. Um, and then I will wrap up and conclude with an outlook and um, I will give um, some summary uh, about the results, uh, what we talked and uh, what are the opportunities related to topic and then we will have a bunch of time for your questions and the I am looking for the discussions with you. So let's start. Um, I am an urban designer originally and since, um, I mean, in the last 15 years, I worked with and I developed several urban design tools, um, mainly including urban design guidelines, special local spatial standards and participatory design tools such as uh, focus groups and gamification and so on. Um, and my, I pursued my PhD on sustainable development and I stick to the urban design scale. So in my case, it was neighborhoods. Um, I focused on sustainable neighborhood design and sustainability assessment. In other words, it is uh, green neighborhood certification systems. Um, so maybe you are already aware of some of the certification systems such as uh, lead neighborhood development or BREAM communities. Um, the main aim during my PhD was uh, achieving a comprehensive sustainability starting from the local scales and uh, by comprehensive sustainability I mean here involving all social, environmental, economic, ec economical, and institutional um, aspects of sustainability. But then I realized uh, we have many tools for environment and economy, and institutional part is already about regulation and laws, but we really underestimated the social aspect of the sustainability, and there is um, there is a huge lack of um, how we collect the um, social data and how we reflect that data uh, into uh, real solutions. So it is already known um, geoinformation provides uh, useful tools for management analysis and planning of environments. 
And in the intersection of the sustainability and geoinformation, it is mostly used for analysis, for example, in terms of resource management and sometimes for predictions for future development, uh, such as urban growth, for example. And uh, in the intersection of urban design and geoinformation, um, geoinformation usually used as a communication tool. Um, for example, like um, translating the information to an understandable format for citizens. And sometimes it has been used for participation and data collection as well. So I thought how I can improve these uh, tools for to provide collective solutions. So since 2018, I am mostly um, working on the uh, geo-information domain and trying to uh, merge different aspects of urban development. They are definitely not separated, but I am trying to bridge uh, the gaps between them. So by collective solutions, uh, maybe I should define it first. Uh, collective solutions means um, the, um, the outcome that satisfies um, the user's perceptions, needs, and priorities in the possible widest extent. And doing this is only possible if we have um, effective data-driven methods and effective visualization techniques. Visualization has very important here because it is the key aspect how we translate the information into a, a reasonable, understandable format Bo for both ends, actually, for urban planners and for citizens. But um, in the current state, uh, being focused on collective solutions, in the current state, it is not very possible um, because the current status quo of uh, participatory urban planning is mainly forms from a one-wave informative process from decision makers to the public. For example, usually there is already a proved plan uh, about your neighborhood or your street, and um, the participation is usually the participation process is usually for informing you about that already approved plan. And then you can object it. And then the uh, decision makers decide if your objection is reasonable and uh, worth to um, consider. So it is a quite subjective uh, process is going on in the current state. There is also um, so the communication with the public is also very weak, uh, especially in terms of reaching to broad spectrum of the public. Um, it is funny, but in the current state, it is usually the citizens' uh, responsibility to go and check the municipality's website if there is any meeting has planned, if there is any changes is going on, and. Um, if there is a meeting, if they are able to um, participate in it. Um, so these traditional methods in the uh, current state definitely, therefore, inefficient in understanding um, uh, most aspects of development, actually, because they also require to require from citizens to be in a particular place and in a particular time. And it also eliminates the possibility that we can understand time and location related patterns um, about the participation decisions, participants' decisions. Therefore, um, Therefore sorry, I can hear myself. Okay, now it is better. Um, so, um, one of the reasons that is um, there is there is definitely a need for time efficient data driven approaches that enables distributed systems independent from time and space 
and uh, automates the uh, data processing and data collecting uh, processing processes for uh, urban development. And there is definitely a lack of methods in providing a collective outcome because it is not only the um, the participatory process is not only about data collection, it is also about providing a subjective outcome, uh, the collective solution that will meet um, the needs of the public. So by being focused on data-driven approaches, so how they can help urban design um, so you got the general idea, but they also provide an alternative design approach. But during the design process, they also create tools um, by directly interacting with data from the participants. This kind of uh, approach can strengthen the transparency, encourage collaboration and enable effective public participation. Uh, usually data-driven approaches are um, one of the topics in smart cities and uh, they work with um, various sensors that might be fixed um, at certain points in your city and they might be simply your uh, sensors in your mobile phone. So the image here actually uh, represents with your mobile phone it is actually possible to collect time and location related real time data. And then it is collected and processed and it's an agile process. Actually, when you come up with the information out of that, you can create something and then you can again continuously collect data and put more on it because urban development, urban planning processes are active processes, it doesn't end with a one final uh, product. Uh, of course, we have strategic plans for the next 30 years. We have a vision, but urban design is an ongoing project and it needs to be flexible. It needs to collect data th uh, throughout the process, development process. <clears throat> um, so yeah, we already, I already put it out, uh, the data-driven approach is supported by the real-time user data. Uh, one important point is here, uh, user data needs to be uh, with user consent. Um, so in terms of data-driven approaches, the um, user privacy um, might be an issue and ethics, ethics might be an issue. So there are several pillars there but I'm not going to focus uh, those aspects right now. But let's assume the all collected data is collected with the user content. Um, so they are very important to transfer data into understandable and functional form together with the visualization and help to understand citizens' perceptions, needs and priorities by providing real-time data in the real environment or real-life environment. Um, then it makes it easier to reflect them into urban processes because in the current state, we are not able to understand um, the perceptions, needs and priorities. Um, so, of course, in combination with visualization techniques, they support literate citizens, but also they support literate um, decision makers. Uh, because the information flow in this case is uh, in two ways, from users to decision makers and from decision makers to users. Uh, but in terms of citizens, uh, it, it helps them to be aware of their surroundings and they more willing to contribute to development in a transparent environment. Sorry. Um, so this image here from Boston, uh, if you're interested in data-driven approaches in urban development um, in different test packs, uh, I strongly suggest you to go to MIT Sensable City Lab um, webpage and then uh, there are a wide range of examples there. Um, 
This map is called desirable streets. So what they do here is by using mobile phone and navigation systems, um, they come up with a map with desirable streets uh, that the users, the habitant chooses. Um, and then once they have those streets, they compared it with the shortest path possible from point A to B. And they try to understand what makes a street more attractive and desirable. They, such information actually can help urban planners a lot in terms of creating lively places for citizens um, and for people, people uh, places that people will choose actually to live on and to use. Um, of course, such um, such data driven methods um, can not always um, run into or doesn't have to run into real environment all the time. Sometimes we need some controlled environments and sometimes it helps urban design a lot. Um, and as I said, the visualization techniques uh, plays the key role here to translate uh, the collected data into an understandable form, especially for citizens uh, in terms of participatory urban planning process. Um, and immersive environments, among many others, even uh, to the paper maps is one of the way of translating that information. Um, but immersive environments are uh, one of the latest uh, visualization techniques that we can sim simulate a reality. And um, the immersive environments can be augmented or virtual. Um, and augmented reality or augmented virtuality actually represents um, or combines the real world with the digital representations. So you can see partially the real world and the digital image um, in, in your screen. Uh, but on the other hand, virtual environment is the version, completely modeled version of the reality. So they do not cover, uh, they do not combine it. It is completely digital. Immersive environments can aim presentation and actuation. So in presentation, we do not aim uh, moving around and manipulate the environment. It is uh, only the picture, what, for example, what is planned for your street. So you can see it, you can see it from different angles, you can move around it, but you can not manipulate the environment that you are looking at. It can use different senses, uh, for example, visual, tactile or auditory, and it can be in form of video, um, synthetic visualization or pictures, uh, collages or some hybrid uh, versions. Um, and the actuation is, it aims um, the movement in the environment just like as it is in the reality. And also it allows you to manipulate that environment. So it is a active process. It is more than a representation of what it is there already. Um, in the urban planning context, these technologies provide methods and tools that enable people to connect and use to solve their problems um, and carry out um, given tasks. So I would like to give more detailed information through uh, examples uh, from past and ongoing studies at FG. And the first one is interactive, immersive public displays uh, for participatory urban planning. Um, and the second one is the co-solution. Um, 
which aims an automated assistance tool for participatory urban design, uh, which is a data-driven uh, collective solution process. And the third one is an ongoing project uh, by Samuel Namas Medrano at IFKI. Um, it is called Gesture Enabled Remote Communication and Collaboration. Um, before going to the next slides, uh, as you can see, I didn't take part in each of these examples, but um, I will try my best to um, answer your questions in general uh, framework. But if you are interested to have more detailed uh, information about them, I will be happy to connect you with the responsible person. Just keep in mind. Um, the first example is the inter is about interactive immersive public displays. As you can see it see here, it's a cave like uh, visualization method. And it might be very useful in terms of uh, small scale urban design um, projects. It's a novel approach that combines panoramic videos of locations with overlays depicting the plant buildings. Um, so you can, um, in terms of urban design, you can um, imagine points rather than uh, changing whole neighborhood. Uh, so, in the experiments uh, or in this environment, participants interact with a prototypical implementation. They are able to watch, they are able to enter some comments uh, about the uh, planned project. And um, during the study, they evaluate the immersive public displays in terms of usefulness, ease of use, ease of learning and user satisfaction. So let's see what happened. Um, so as you can see, so let's go to the previous um, slide. As you can see, you can create a cave like uh, environment like this um, that you can see the surrounding. And you can separate the screens to diff for different um, different information. For example, you can see the comments here. You can see the plan here. This is the change that proposed and then people are already entered some comments about the changes. And you can also see the words um, and you can see the constant changes um, in them. I would like to uh, show you a couple of videos. I actually have uh, at least three videos for you um, to explain better how these systems are working. So this is the first one. So actually, as you can see here, you can bring it um, embed into the screen um, some other visualizations, some live documents. You can imagine this as a new um, proposal for a facade there. Um, and it is open to interaction. You can scale it, you can rotate it, you can remove add more and um, so you can create your own design. For example, you can think this as a bench or a tree. It doesn't have to be a live document. And once you locate it, it also uh, gives you some um, depth. So once you locate it, it is always comes with coordinates at the end of this process.
So it is also possible to mirror yourself into the video environment, uh, not necessarily in a business city center, but in some uh, contexts it might be very useful in terms of perceiving the environment um, because it changes, for example, in terms of scale. Uh, these things change the participants' perceptions a lot, so it is also a, an important um, ability of immersive video environments uh, in terms of representing the real uh, world. And it is also important that you can use uh, gestures rather than um, a um, you know, touchpad or computer mouse. Uh, it makes it more intuitive. So just imagine once you uh, modify that video environment, um, it is possible to um, obtain the location-based data based on your changes. So it helps an urban planner a lot to understand what um, participants and users want in their environment um, at the end. So uh, it also explains uh, what happens behind the scenes. Uh, let's look at it a bit more. Uh, the first things first, you need to uh, make a site selection. So there is already designated areas for the uh, urban design projects in reality. So just imagine those are the points. And then you need to construct a graph to be able to um, move from screen to screen. But in immersive video environments, you need to jump from screen to screen. So it is not intuitive. You cannot um, really move um, through the streets, for example, to, to be able to go from point A to B. Uh, once you have that point, the designated areas, you need to record uh, a footage. Um, in the real world and then post-process the footage and then and define the graph there um, in the video environment. So to be able to move from A to B. And the red part he here is the participation part. Um, when you define the interaction and the content of the video environment, then you can collect the data once you collect the data and the uh, screen overlays in this case, because you can only create collages here, you can scale um, to the elements, um, you can scale them, give some depth to them, you can move and rotate them, but it is still a collage onto the video environment. And then you need to link those overlays into the nodes in the graph. This is the um, this is where you uh, decide on the locations um, of the made changes. Changes have been made. Um, so in the scope of those uh, of that study, they also made a comparison uh, between the field study uh, lab and immersive video environment. They gave the same task to each participant and then they found out immersive video environments provided a reasonable degree of immersion and presence as uh, expected. And also it was efficient in terms of immediacy and accessibility. It might seem like real world would um, and I mean provide better solution for that, but uh, actually immersive video environments and mutual environments doesn't involve that much stimulation as we have in the uh, real world uh, field studies. Um, 
But on the other hand, the immersive video environment provide a low resolution image, which matters a lot in this kind of studies because it also changes the perception of the um, participants. And um, they provide immersive video environment provided a useful tool for interaction for design and exploration. And they found out the user behavior and per performance were similar in the field and the eye. It is also very important in terms of um, conducting controlled studies for participatory urban planning. They also looked at the suitability of the immersive video environments um, and they found out that they are very useful in terms of rapid prototyping and designing with non-experts. And uh, it has intermediate suitability for performance experience acceptance and privacy related um, studies. Uh, it is related to the tasks actually. And, um, but they found out it is not easy to understand audience behavior and uh, it is not efficient in terms of display effectiveness and social impact. Um, and field studies um, scored higher than uh, the video environments in terms of understanding the behaviors uh, and social impacts. So which brings us to the um, virtual reality actually. So the second example is um, focusing on the virtual reality and compares it with the uh, 3D environment. It is called CoSolution, uh, which I started um, at 2018 uh, in 2018 at TU Vienna and um, the first two phases has finished. Now the third phase is going on as a joint uh, study between TU Vienna and University of Münster. So the main aim uh, of this study um, was actually providing, providing a collective solution uh, by effective visualization and communication, as well as automated data-driven uh, data collection process data collection and data um, analysis process uh, after the day of participation. So um, we created an automated assistance tool for urban planners here. And the ultimate aim was, um, or the targets goals were, were uh, high quality, providing a high quality representation of the real world and testing it in during data collection bridging the gap between participatory process and urban solutions. Uh, as I said, there is definitely a lack of um, collective analysis tools in the current situation. And it is still, however, the collective, the process is, it is still the um, professional's duty to decide which one is uh, worth to um, include into the final design and which which is not it is still subjective so we try to secure objective and collective solutions um, and of course we aim to developing automated systems for decision makers to collectively analyze large number of spatial data obtained through participation. It is necessarily has to be a large number of participation data, but even though the decision making process is collective, collective means collective creation, collective decision making means um, everybody sitting together and decides collectively, but in urban planning situation, it doesn't mean only one outcome. It will be more than one alternative plans at the end. So still the expert needs to, um, needs to be able to effectively analyze and overlap those decisions to be able to come up with a collective solution. So what we did here was, um, modeling 
um, we actually selected a uh, certain area and then modeled it and uh, in 3D environments and virtual reality and then ask participants to modify that initial plan in the participation ecosystems. And then we created an assistance, we developed an assistant system and then tested it with analyzing the modified plans. We had 21 participants and then we had at the end of the participation process, we had 21 separate modified plans. Uh, the assistance system uses GIS and machine learning algorithms um, and the outcome is a framework, a guideline for the urban planners that they can um, build the solution um, according to that. Sorry. So the selected area was a courtyard from um, uh, one of the courtyards of TU Vienna. And we modeled it in 3D and virtual reality. So we had actually some limitations. Here you can see the virtual reality model. Um, and the Limitation was we never been able to reach the exact measurements of the area, uh, but we tried uh, and we just had the ground uh, floor plan. Um, we tried to make the best out of it, um, but there were some distortions at the end. Uh, but the good thing is we um, overcome this uh, limitation because the, all participants were the actual users of the uh, courtyard. They were employees and the students from that building. So um, actually they were knew the area very well. It didn't matter that much, but it matters a lot if you are going to represent the real world in the virtual reality uh, for a wide range of participants then uh, it needs to be quite accurate. But I guess we did a good job at the end. And the second limitation was uh, we created the model at Unity 3D uh, and we used the existing um, models uh, for the trees and um, bushes, for example. And it actually end up with a really bright, lively, clean version of the courtyard. And we thought it might be a um, definitely a limitation at the end because uh, it also changes the perception of the users um, because because they when they see a very clean, bright, colorful environment, then they have the um, perception that Many things doesn't need to be changed, but it is actually. But in our case, again, it was the actual participants were the actual users of the area and they knew exactly what they need to. Um, so we overcome those challenges. Um, so there is another video here, how we conducted the um, participatory process. So everything in the courtyard was interactable. So the participants were allowed to enable to grab them, move into the area, drop them to somewhere else, relocate them. And um, actually, even trees, green areas, uh, he is holding a uh, light pole right now everything uh, was interactable. So they were able to relocate, rescale, uh, rotate, remove and add those elements into the courtyard. So it is a bit dark, but I hope you can see it. Uh, at least I hope it gives a um, general understanding. There is also a possibility that participants were allowed to go onto the roof and look um, down from a bird eye view. So they were 
be able to see the whole area in their plan um, whenever they want to. So this was the visualization and data collection part. Um, so I didn't add the, uh, we actually do not have um, too much images for the first experiment in 3D environment, but maybe I can just note it here before I start to uh, data processing part of the project. Uh, but in the 3D environment, uh, we conducted it in front of a, a computer monitor and uh, citizen um, participants were asked to modify the same courtyard, the tasks were the same and the interaction patterns were the same. So they were able to rescale, rotate, uh, relocate uh, and add and remove the elements uh, within the environment by using a mouse. Um, in the first experiment, we collected uh, Actually, many of the users, um, participants were participated in both experiments. Um, but the first one was only the trial version of the second one. And then, then um, we extended it in the virtual reality because the main aim was to achieve a um, real-like version of the system and we chose the 3D and virtual reality. It is also important because they allow us uh, to make it distributed in the future. It was one of the targets in the first uh, third phase of the project. We would like to have a distributed system that everyone can join, participate um, independent from a certain location and certain time. And it will also allow participants to communicate with each other and create collectively as well. Uh, but in this case, uh, each participant um, created the design by own, and then we end up with 21 modified plans. And um, there were several studies out um, attempted to and focusing on uh, the data collection. Um, but even when I talk with my colleagues that who are focusing on this with big projects, they are still telling me um, it is still a mess at the end of the day um, about how they are going to collectively analyze all those data. Because at the end of the day, if it is a, for example, if it is an urban plan, not, not in neighborhood design, but urban plan, we are talking about thousands of people and at least um, maybe hundreds of different uh, layouts that we need to analyze and um, come up with something that will guide to the collective solution. So um, the second part of the project was the data processing. Um, the assistance tool. So we developed a, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I need a minute here because my computer will turn off. Um, okay, this part was about data processing and what we are trying to do is uh, providing an automated analysis tool, um, I mean data-driven approach for data processing uh, after the day of participation. So what we developed, uh, the assistance tool, the first thing it's do, it's doing is uh, overlapping uh, all plans together and then it creates a fishnet, a grid system, and it starts to make the calculations. It, it intersects the objects areas with the grid system and then it creates some centroids. So the third, uh, the fourth image here, actually it contains thousands of centroids. Um, 
And what is it doing? It analyzes objects separately. So for example, um, this fourth image here, um, there are overlaps uh, for green areas, um, for only green areas, all 21 planes were merged here. And it is the same for the trees, benches, um, children's slides, uh, playground, uh, just you name it, everything you can see in that um, initial plan. And then it uh, applies some iterations and try to find the um, percentages that how many people agreed on one cell uh, for one um, object. And it creates some summaries for the urban planner. Um, for example, here, uh, it creates colors for each element and um, gives some color scales, then you know, for example, the color get darker, then uh, more people agreed on one object in that particular area. For example, for the green area, it is the most understandable here. It is a very small image, but of course it comes with a uh, legend and uh, extra information. So I just, took out the um, images out of it. Um, so for example, for the green areas here, it is for this area at least 15 uh, person agreed those cells in those cells uh, and put green area on them. And it, it decreases uh, when the uh, color gets lighter. So for this one, it is not 15, it is 10, it is five, and maybe here it's one. So it also creates uh, tables for each cell uh, and each image that you can see here. And it creates a summary and it gives you uh, in which location, in which cell, um, how many different objects are located there. For example, for 347 in this location, this exact location, there are 30 points and they are representing uh, flower pots, green area, and it is the same here, but uh, the majority is different. It also gives you the percentages for each object. So for example, from the urban planning, urban design perspective, if uh, if I see this uh, before I come up with a um, concept plan, then if I see this, 100% of the people for this particular cell decided green area on that location, then as an urban planner, I need to uh, provide a green area there because everybody wants it there. So it gives very detailed information, but of course, if you uh, increase this cell size, because we wanted to um, have very detailed information at the end, because but you can change the cell size and you can have a more rough idea. And also uh, the main aim for us to have, to fit at least one object into that particular cell size, uh, but it can be definitely, it will be different if your scale is a region or a city. Then because uh, your objects will change. Our object was trees and benches, but if you are going to plan a city and apply this uh, method into it, uh, then your object will be buildings uh, and the cell size would be, would be very different. We also conducted some surveys on the um, yeah on the acceptance of um, different plans and uh, effectiveness of different visualization technique. After the first um, experiment on 3D environments, we also created uh, it. We never aimed to create a final plan. We just wanted to guide urban designer to provide the final plan because. Um, at the end, the final plan needs to be created by someone 
an expert uh, who knows the urban planning laws and regulations very well. Um, but we just wanted to see, uh, and I took the advantage that I am an urban planner, uh, we wanted to see uh, how uh, how the participants uh, are going to react to the final plan and what will be the acceptance of it. So we created one uh, after the 3D uh, experiment. And we asked them to compare their own design, the initial um, state of the courtyard and the final design that we, or the collective design that we created. And uh, we were expecting that they, uh, they were going to um, rate their own plan the highest uh, in all uh, points here. But actually the collective plan achieved higher score in a couple of um, elements. For example, according to the participants, it provided more interesting environments it provided more sufficient environment in terms of sufficiency of seating area, sufficiency of green area, uh, and they found it more lively and open to communication. It was actually very interesting to see and it scored higher in each point um, than the initial plan. It was very promising and it actually uh, encourage us to take the second step and uh, run the uh, virtual reality experiment as well. After we conducted the uh, experiment in virtual reality, we also asked them to compare the 3D and virtual reality experiences. Um, and actually, even though uh, almost most of the participants didn't have uh, any experience in virtual reality and actually all of them, none of them had experience in uh, participatory urban design. Um, virtual reality provided more intuitive and confident process for them because it wasn't very easy uh, many of the participants to be able to if you do not know the software very well it is not easy to um, modify the environment or the objects by using a computer mouse but on the other hand um, after a 10 minutes of training uh, in virtual reality. We did the same thing in 3D as well. Uh, but after 10 minutes of training in virtual reality, it was all very intuitive and everyone starting to very confidently uh, design the environment. It was more of a game rather than, um, rather than a task, actually. Um, yeah, virtual reality um, scored higher in terms of confidence. Um, they found it more exciting. Um, it, 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 of course, uh, is not traditional for most of the participants. And they think it was more easy to use. They, there wasn't too many obstacles uh, to be able to uh, run the task that they are given. So it actually gives an understanding what can happen. Um, we just played with the results. It doesn't have to look this way. Um, but once you have that grid, then you can easily um, have it as a base for your urban design and then start to play with your uh, objects that you need to uh, provide that particular designated area. So it actually shows you uh, where can you put your trees and where can you put your sitting areas. You can alternatively put your um, children playground here, but also it can be located here as well. It might be in the middle of a sitting area or stink areas might, might be uh, distributed and it might be stand alone. So it, there are different, it 
leads to different alternatives at least. As a result uh, of this uh, two-phased uh, ongoing um, project, virtual reality so far provided an accurate representation of the real world and an intuitive participation process. Um, usability of virtual reality was higher for different uh, um, and various age groups. Um, we actually be able to test it between seven and 65 years old. Um, we had something in, at TU Vienna called Geotag uh, for three days, which people are just coming in and playing with what you are doing um, and testing your studies, which was a, a very good opportunity for us to test um, and compare these 3D and virtual reality environments. And as I said, after a couple of minutes later, seven years old, uh, they didn't design that much, but they crashed very well. They were really intuitive. Uh, they scale, they throw things around and they had fun. And for six to five years old, uh, even though they have no experience um, or not much experience with the computers at all, uh, it was easier for them to play with. Um, the same process could be applied with AR as well. We thought about it. Um, but in terms of um, deciding between augmented reality and virtual reality, virtual reality enabled a controlled environment for us and provided the possibility for a distributed system. So, uh, it, as I said, it is still a plan. Um, but um, we would like to merge these uh, data collection with gamification as an urban design game in virtual reality and 3D environment again. And um, so virtual reality gives us that opportunity. Um, compared to a video environment, virtual reality provided a wider picture and more flexibility in the action. So in the video environment, you you uh, limited with creating or playing with um, two dimensional images and collages. But in virtual reality, there is no actually limitation as long as you have a strong um, PC there. Uh, you can model a whole city, you can move around the city you can change as much as you like um, it is it has that flexibility and of course it uh, provides high resolution but as i said it is also important in some cases not in our case but in some cases it might be important to uh, give the real picture rather than that very lively colorful representation of the environment Um, so, I would like to also give an example. I think it is very novel approach because, um, yes, immersive environments are create, um, or not immersive environments in general, but virtual reality, augmented reality, and um, immersive video environments. Um, enables us to represent the real world in a better way. But at the same time, they are not applicable for everyone and everywhere. Uh, so there are differences between countries in terms of accessibility of the devices. Also, there are differences, for example, virtual reality is definitely not for everyone. Um, so there is also a need to merge existing traditional methods with these technologies. Um, so this gesture-enabled remote communication and collaboration, this is an ongoing work, um, aims to uh, kind of achieve that, um, that need. So it aims to develop a system for enabling hand gestures in a remote collaboration scenario. Um, there are two twin tabletop systems. Uh, so I think in the future, it will be uh, more than two. Uh, with a depth camera, as you can see here. 
so the camera is here, uh, and a projector attached. So this system recognizes and captures your hand gestures and trans transmits it to the twin systems. So actually what you are doing on the, the paper here, um, the twin system, the other person in the twin system can see it uh, in a very accurate way. It can be combined with the digital, digital tabletop systems or it can be combined with a pa simple paper map. So it is important and it is uh, not very expensive to have and um, it is applicable in different ways. Uh, it also allows um, collaboration more than one person in one tabletop system. So it is also uh, possible to work with, um, it doesn't limit it with two person with two twin tabletop systems. Uh, I would like to also provide a uh, clearer picture for that as well. So this is the digital map of uh, Moonstyle. And once someone starts to, um, in this case, it, uh, it doesn't involve modification, but it is also possible. You can still add um, some objects, modify uh, the, the um, screen here in the future. It is ongoing, um, but it is also makes it possible to more than two people in different, completely different places, they can collaborate together, see what they are doing and um, create together. So it is again a, a way for collective decision making. And once you have that information and once you have that modified plans, it is again, if it is a um, digital tabletop system you still have the location based information once you have that then it is always possible to uh, use an assistance tool like that we created in the co-solution and provide a collective um, collective layout that will guide you uh, so i'm almost done um, what I try to do is for today is to provide you a framework about possible tools and techniques for inclusive participatory urban design. So we always need to um, word inclusive, keep in mind uh, when we talk about participatory urban design, because it is not only about, uh, about the people who can do it, but also we need to encourage people from every group to be part of it because every decision is important for urban development. Um, also, uh, I would like to give a picture for immersive environments as an alternative design and participatory data collection uh, tool, uh, not an approach, but a tool and the general understanding and examples for alternative design approaches that provides a collective design process and um, the tools for and approaches for collective outcome. As a result, um, we can say that data-driven approaches provide strong and time-effective methods that uh, automates uh, both data collection and processing which at the end encourage transparency, participation and collaboration in design, encourage urban planners to, um, to conduct participatory processes because currently it is a very time consuming, uh, very hard task for them too as well. Uh, they are really discouraged to follow that path. So our work is to create um, tools that will ease that um, limitations. And of course, ultimately, um, those approaches contribute comprehensive sustainability that brings together social, environmental, economic 
and institutional aspects of urban development and sustainability. And we can say that immersive environments uh, provide immersive, realistic, low effort and accessible uh, representation of the real world. And they are providing useful tool for studying and testing participatory urban design practices. Um, and they provide better understanding in terms of behavioral cognitive aspect of a design process, um, perceptions of the uh, participants and the hints behind their decisions. Um, yeah, and for future, there are many opportunities that we can improve this kind of studies. Um, there is strong connection with um, spatial optimization studies. Um, it can be merged with multi-criteria decision-making analysis. It definitely um, needs input and can give input uh, to the cognitive studies. Uh, once we have enough data, it is a matter of time they will be uh, part of artificial intelligence and machine learning um, direction. And there is a connection with eye tracking studies. It can also be part of cognitive uh, studies as well. Um, yeah, there is definitely a strong connection with smart cities, sustainable cities and location-based services too. Um, it is all on my part, so thank you very much. Uh, I am looking forward to your questions and if you, if something comes to your mind or if you would like to connect uh, one of the responsible person uh, from the projects that I uh, presented, please do not hesitate to uh, send me a, an email to my way. I will always happy to answer your questions and help you in a way I can. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simke. It was really interesting and enlightening in, in many ways. Um, there. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to stop sharing. <laughs> uh, yeah, so there are some questions, so I will just go through them and, um, and read them for you. Uh, anyway, I would like to ask first if uh, like any of these designs you show us, uh, if we have a chance to see them in some places, like where they actually used um, by the uh, designers. I mean, um, I mean, where, the, where your suggestions actually used in real life, like where the actual place is designed uh, based on your suggestions. Um, well, actually, this kind of approaches needs to be uh, implemented in in daily urban design processes mm -hmm. because um, so the current state um, probably you are aware to. I mean, uh, the, our participants in each um, projects that I um, presented, um, people doesn't even know they are allowed to participate into the decision-making processes. But at the end of the day, we are living in this environment. And it's, and even there are some cases, for example, um, some urban planner from, I don't know, from US plans somewhere in Germany without asking anything to citizens, but it's, you know, claims that it is very sustainable, but it also depends how the uh, people live in there. Sometimes if you do not involve the social aspect into the uh, urban planning process, it will never be successful, at least as much as we imagine it. Um, so I would, I mean, for example, um, 3D systems, it is, definitely very applicable for in many municipality. It is very easy to distribute. So it can be easily applied in uh, many cities um, to be able to connect with the participant. But it is not the only case. 
they, we also need better communication systems. So municipalities need to reach out to the public. It is not citizens responsibility to go and check if if there is any changes and um, so it is only one phase of it I would say um, they are they should definitely be integrated according to the abilities accessibility to the tools that I talked uh, it might be immersive video environments, it might be virtual reality, it might be gamification on mobile phones, 3D environments. Um, it needs to be embedded, integrated into the current systems that we have, uh, besides better communication methods with the public, which I did not focus particularly, but even social media is a way to do it. So is it my connection or um, you are frozen right now? Uh, it is probably her that is frozen, not you. I don't think she's coming back anytime soon, but there are questions that you probably can't see in the chat, so I'm just going to read them. And the first question is, has the urban design research changed in the last 15 years? How much and which are the main trends now? I am, uh, Jana says that I am also an urban design researcher, res researcher, but I know only the background of urban design methods of last five years. Um, can, I, can I hear the second question again? Uh, the second thing was just the uh, background. Uh, the question is, has the urban design research changed in the last 15 years? How much and which are the main trends now? Um, yeah, urban design. Yeah, well, actually, um, a lot changed in the research in the last 15 years. Um, but the main difference um, seemed occurred in the research area. So still urban planning. So in many countries, uh, including um, including Germany and Turkey and Austria, for example, uh, we are still um, using 100 years old uh, urban planning laws and regulations. They do not change too much. And urban planning actually have uh, many different scales um, and even urban design started to seen as a different domain that brings together architecture and urban planning or bridge in between them uh, as a separate domain. Um, so yeah, actually in practice, um, those domains started to um, differentiate it from general urban planning and um, I would say the direction is more in the um, in the path to uh, sustainable urban development. So almost everything is about sustainability and having certifications. For example, in my PhD, I focused on certification systems, and then I found out it is kind of commercialized way of saying that we are doing things in sustainable way, but it actually doesn't refer 100% um, sustainable environments. Um, so it goes to that direction. It still is, it still is going to that direction, but I wouldn't say in terms of um, participatory urban planning, it doesn't change too much. Uh, but collective creation notion uh, came to the came into the picture in the last five years. Uh, but I wouldn't say in real world. If we are going to talk about, I mean, if we are talking about the real practices, it is not still very uh, part of the practice. Uh, 
the participation still is going on with, um, you know, small focus groups and um, council meetings with the municipality, collecting objections from citizens and um, deciding which one is making sense and which one is not. Uh, thank you. And uh, Yolanta asked, uh, if you participate in sustain sustainability environment in the cities, do you also collect flight data about the hotspot hotspots in cities? I mean, where would be the best place to put trees, new parks, green roofs to reduce the heat in the cities? Uh, okay, um, yeah, it is actually a great question and it is a very good example for data-driven approaches. Um, so we can, um, do you remember the first image that I show uh, with, uh, uh, re related to my background? There was urban design, sustainability and GIS. So um, in the connection of sustainability and GIS, there is a strong analysis uh, intersection. Um, GIS already allows us to um, collect that information regarding the air quality, um, heat island effects, um, etc. And um, urban design, actually, this is also a very good question in terms of describing the collective solution. And urban design trying to understand the um, and provide the solutions um, that meets the needs of environment and the public. So it is very possible to merge those two data. Once we have the, um, so let's say this way, uh, in terms of cost solution, you can provide the information to the citizens in a very initial format, for example, like we did in the uh, courtyards. We didn't change anything in the courtyard and just ask the participants to create their own plans. But what you can do is also, you can uh, provide a draft plan based on the uh, air quality or heat island effect data, and you can uh, define some limitations. For example, we already have some standards in terms of urban planning. We, we also can have defined some standards to in decrease the heat island effect uh, or the amount of green area, open area that we need in a particular environment. Um, so we didn't um, aim to create a really collective creation process, but we focused on the collective solution part, so the data processing part. But it is also um, um, possible to define the constraints before you ask participants to design the environment. So for example, they cannot um, plan uh, green areas less than, um, let's say, uh, 50 square meters. So it, it is possible to merge that those information, data-driven information uh, into one uh, bucket and then come up with one solution out of it. It is about uh, defining the constraints, defining the rules and standards that we need locally. And then we can ask people to uh, put their input into it. I hope it answers the question. I'm so very sorry for leaving my Wi-Fi job so here, but I'm really happy to see that uh, you proceeded <laughs> without me. Uh, so if uh, anyone else wants to continue, I can just <laughs> not involve um, because I don't know what, I'm sorry, I don't know what you talked about. <laughs> It was one question and answer since you left. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm on my phone now and I don't think I can see. Oh no, it's here. Yep, I found it. Okay. Um, and what was the question? <laughs> so I, I don't ask it again. Um, in I mean, as I remember, it was uh, how much urban design practice changed in the last 15 years. Okay, good. 
Okay, so uh, no, uh, sorry, it was about um, how we can use uh, the the topics that I presented, uh, data driven approaches, for example, in terms of decreasing the heat island effect uh, and the data driven approaches there to understand the um, um, the necessities to decrease it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question about how the how the urban design research changed was already answered because it's yeah. too yeah, yeah and okay. that one and the heat line heat island okay. effect one. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, okay, and your question. Um, that's more about I would say your personal story, maybe how does one become an urban designer? And maybe you can answer more in general or maybe tell a little bit more about your particular story to this um, to this job. Um, how one can become an urban designer is this the question. Um, so actually, uh, I am not sure about Czech Republic, but in most cities there is no uh, different department called urban design. So to be able to become an urban designer, you need to um, usually uh, graduate from urban planning department or architecture. Uh, but it is definitely, I mean, in this age, it is not possible to uh, complete the separate different disciplines from each other, like what I'm doing, actually. I am not 100% uh, GIS scientist, I'm not 100% sustainability expert or urban designer, so I merged somehow everything together and I'm trying to come up with something original, so this is usually what we are doing. <clears throat> So what I'm trying to say is uh, it is also definitely possible if you are working with necessary tools, um, then you definitely become part of urban design process. So this is actually what I was trying to explain in the presentation. Urban design is not one person job. It is very collective process requires many disciplines together uh, and citizens as well uh, and there is nothing called urban design certification the only way to do it is having a, a an urban design master and then you can have the diploma uh, this is the um, way that i pursued so I graduated from city and regional planning and then had my master's in urban design and then pursued my PhD in uh, sustainable development and then having my postdoc in, at geoinformation. But I would say uh, definitely um, master doing uh, UD master is um, the most concrete way to do it. And they usually, um, it is usually open to architectures, landscape architectures, uh, urban planners, and um, I don't know, it depends on the university that you are applying for because there are always some exceptions as well. Great, thank you. And uh, maybe question which is somehow related to this one. Um, how could uh, people who have degrees from information studies be helpful um, in this kind of research or this kind of work? Like, can they be any help for urban designers? Yeah, actually, it would be great. <laughs> and if there would be that help, uh, maybe I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't, um, be here today exp explaining what I'm doing. Um, so there is definitely need for um, automated um, data driven, <laughs> I will come to the main topic, um, tools that actually it took me two years to understand all those methodologies to apply what I'm doing with the co-solution. It took two years for me, but for a uh, computer scientist or for an informatics student, it is 
maybe a matter of a couple of months. So we never have that uh, education in urban planning and urban design. But this is why I'm saying it is definitely an interdisciplinary, especially urban design. Uh, I'm not talking about urban planning here. I didn't do much urban planning, but especially urban design is a very multidisciplinary uh, discipline itself. Um, so, I mean, as an information st informatics student, um, the main topic in urban design, I think it is communication. Communication technologies is very important. Um, how we are going to collect data effectively, it is very important. And um, there are many other fields that they can contribute a, under the term of smart cities as well. It is all about ICT, communication technologies, sensors, data collection and processing. Thank you for your answer. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to get back to, <laughs> to chat to see the questions. Um, one moment. Mm. Yeah. Okay, uh, so another question would be uh, What is your vision of future use of data driven methods in relation to urban design? Um, okay, my vision is, so if you're going to talk about the 20, 30, 50 years later, um, so I am actually a bit of the dark side of, um, of urban planning domain. So I think um, how it is uh, implemented is not the way to implement it. <laughs> So it will change a lot in the next couple of years, in the next decades, and probably the um, you know sensors and mobile phones and the data that we collected uh, through them will be the basic information that we use to plan our cities, because we can extract many information by using only by using mobile data but also um, there is um, it doesn't mean the need for an urban planner or urban designer will not be there we will still need urban designers and urban planners because they will be the moderator of this data collection and data processing process but it will be a lot uh, multidisciplinary rather than a, being a, a couple of decision makers deciding um, how we are going to live. It will be a more collective process. Um, and also, um, there is also, in my vision, there is also a uh, dark pattern there, which is um, we will think about um, personal privacy and security a lot because everything, most of the things will be according to the data collection uh, and data driven approaches. Many things will be automated. So we will need to be aware which information we are given, how um, the decision makers tracking us. It is. Even today, it's an issue which most of us are not aware of, but in the future, it will be a uh, crucial aspect we need to think of. Okay, thanks. Uh, another question is more specific, I would say, and it's how long it takes a group to create a model of an area in virtual reality. <laughs> Um, so in our case, um, so they didn't create the model uh, collaboratively. It was, as I said, individually uh, they created their plans. But in our case, it took between uh, 20 minutes to 45-ish minutes. It was it was below um, an hour. Um, 
but it is also the um, related to the scale uh, that you are working with. Um, so, I mean, um, let's talk about if it would be in uh, real life implementation that then we would need a, um, we would have a time framework for that. So um, probably in the current situation, uh, they are, for example, hanging the uh, approved plan somewhere, um, advertising it, and it, there is a one month framework that you can go see an object. Probably it will be something like that. There will be a one month framework to collect the ideas from the participants. And then it doesn't matter that much if it's a distributed system, then one can create a design in two weeks and other might do it in 30 minutes. Because um, it is also matters. Um, I mean, you need to think about it. You need to go back to it. If you need to, then you should be able to do it. So I would say it would be a um, time framework and then you can now control how long uh, it takes for person to person. But in our case, if question was that, then in our case, it was in between um, 20 minutes minimum and let's say 50 minutes maximum. That's quite fast. <laughs> well, at least I, 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 I didn't expect that. Like, yeah, I expected something much more. Um, Okay, uh, I think um, we can... Sorry, to... I should add that for the uh, previous question. In a 3D environment, it took a lot more. It took uh, minimum one hour, one to one and a half hour. Uh, so it was much more harder to, um, I don't know, easily use the um, computer mouse to um, provide the design. Sorry. <laughs> No problem. Uh, okay, uh, there are now like, I would say, three questions that can be merged into one, or I will just read them all, and they are basically all about your you personally and your um, your relations to, to this area, I mean to this uh, field of study. Uh, first of them is, why have you chosen studies in urban design and sustainable urban development? Uh, what were you interested most in this field? Um, yeah, <laughs> let, let, let's just stay. Um, um, so my career path was like, uh, I started something and then I realized the problem there and I started to focus on that. I realized a new problem and it goes like a chain like that. Um, when I was studying urban planning, it was between um, 2001 to 2005, I realized that, so the urban design was very new in the field then, and there were just a couple of uh, urban design master programs, and I realized, so I'm a very local person. I, I think, I always think that solutions needs to be local because they are contextual. Um, therefore, I wanted to provide something local that drive me to lead me to the uh, urban design studies. Um, then while I was working on urban design, um, I was, um, my master thesis was about um, contemporary urban design approaches and I was looking uh, new approaches throughout the world. And then I saw, okay, sustainability is the main approach here. We need to achieve some goals, uh, sustainable development goals, but still we do not, do not have uh, very well defined principles at the neighborhood scale that I am working with. Then I started to look at sustainable development in my PhD. Then I realized there is something called certification systems and I wondered how they worked. And I realized the problem there uh, and in my PhD thesis, I, uh, uh, I suggested a local certification system, developed one. Um, 
And then I realized, okay, it is really hard to understand the social aspect. We are talking about comprehensive sustainability, different pillars and everything, but social pillar is always underestimated and left out. So I wanted to promote that aspect as an urban planner because it is the um, main stone of locality, uh, which people makes a place uh, a space, actually, people make a space, um, a place, livable place. Without people, it is just a an empty space. So I wanted to focus on that part and I realized, okay, um, it is not only urban planners' fault because uh, it is really time consuming. Economically, it is again consuming and time-wise as well. So I decided to autom provide some um, crucial tools that can bridge those um, empty spaces. Uh, this is why I focused on GIS actually. And I am actually very happy to combine different disciplines into one uh, because it's definitely provided me a wide perspective. It provided me a great network. And um, so I can, even in my daily life, I can see things a bit differently than I did uh, as just an urban planner. I'm not saying it's, it's a bad thing, but I'm saying different um, disciplines gave me a lot of new capabilities and new uh, point of views. Thank you. Um, there is no favorite, by the way. By the way, <laughs> I love I love all the disciplines that I'm involved in. <laughs> yeah, I think that's really important. Uh, we are unfortunately out of time, but uh, if you don't mind, I would just add one more question, last question, which just came to my mind. Uh, you were talking about uh, people in, like people <laughs> wanting to build a um, nice livable environment around them and I would like to ask you if uh, you can see any differences between different let's say countries because I, I, as I understood you have quite international experience Turkey then Austria now Germany so if you maybe can identify some differences between these communities or in I mean in relation of inhabitants to to their environment or maybe their willingness to participate in the in building this environment um so perspectives from different countries uh towards the participation urban design or participatory decision making processes right um so in turkey we I mean, again, I'm talking about the current state in uh, implementation in real life. I'm not talking about research, right? This is not the question. It is real life. So in real life in Turkey, we do not have uh, something called participatory urban planning processes. Um, I mean, participation, there is participation at some level, uh, but uh, it's more of a collaborative work between um, researchers, um, you know, public workers and um, businessmen, etc. So it is not public, actually. Um, I can say in general, um, um, the practice is not willing to um, create together with the um, public. But it is a bit different in the UK. UK has a great, uh, United Kingdom has a uh, long history. I hear something weird. <laughs> okay, it's gone. Um, UK has a long history um, in terms of public participation. So I would say they are uh, in the top five in terms of achieving really participatory planning processes. Um, it wasn't an issue in Austria. In Austria, at least in my experience, according to the feedbacks from my net network, they do not even uh, acknowledge that they can participate into urban planning processes. It is someone else's work. And it is 
just like in globalization, in economic situation, the dominant uh, application is the US approach. So you um, hire an urban designer, a firm that doing urban design and they are doing their own things. So municipalities never require a participatory process. It is how it works in US. Uh, of course, there are some exceptions. Um, I really do not know yet in Germany how it works. I don't know. <laughs> I recently moved here. I didn't learn yet. But um, yeah, the dominant uh, characteristics is they usually do not willing to create a pub, um, public participation, at least in the wide uh, extent, because it is too much work, because there are lack of tools. And also, uh, there are, is always an economical uh, part of it. It is a bit more dominant. For example, if you are going to build a shopping mall, then it brings, if it brings too much money to the municipality, then no one doesn't care what public thinks about it, actually. You can still give your objection on the plan, but uh, there are really, really strict uh, limitations if you want to do it. For example, uh, if your window doesn't look at that particular construction and a particular shopping mall, if it doesn't um, you know, cut your sunlight, you cannot object it. You cannot do it. It is already restricted. Um, so yeah, I mean, we need something more free, flexible, and really inclusive, which I wanted to emphasize during the presentation as well. It needs to be inclusive. Um, I mean, I don't know every country, of course, but among um, US, UK, um, Germany, Austria, and Turkey, um, and maybe a bit of Japan, um, so I would say UK is the only country that really uh, tries to uh, implement participatory processes. Otherwise, it is just uh, conventional tools and meetings. You are muted. I cannot hear you. I'm so sorry. Um, I don't know what's wrong with you. Um, okay, um, basically I was um, saying thank you for your answers, uh, for your very interesting um, presentation. And um, hopefully um, you'll see more of these slides uh, in slide and real life to build a beautiful environment. Yeah, I hope so. so. <laughs> Uh, loučím se teda i s vámi se všemi. Moc se ještě jednou omlouvám za svoje technické potíže. Doufám, že to moc <laughs> zkomplikovalo situaci. Zvládli jste to skvěle. Tak um, děkuji moc. Budu se těšit za příští týden. Skvěle. And just as a side note, um, I mean, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to reach me anytime you want, anytime something you came to my mind, it came to your mind, uh, related to your career on urban design or sustainable development or the approaches that I presented. So I would be happy to answer all the time, just as a reminder. Thank you very much to giving me the opportunity. Have a great evening. Nice evening. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you.